Welcome to the InfoMullet YouTube channel. If you enjoy this content, please like or share. And if you'd like to support the InfoMullet by becoming a mulleteer, visit us on Patreon. We appreciate your support. Those, um, you know, uh, to come back to everybody to come back into the video sort of version as well so we can sort of see one another. The more questions you have, the better. We just covered a lot. Need a minute to think about them. That's yeah, a lot of material. Yeah, that's a that's my bad. <laughs> no, no, no. It's good. This is what we need, right? And and it's so nice to be able to have some uh, a voice uh, coming in who's been studying very specific elements of it. That's the, that's the joke behind the blog name of the info mullet is I tend to have a lot of information, so it was the TLDR up front, full context in the back. So I knew I could trust you for that, Tim. So <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a mullet, but now I just have hair. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question to sort of try to draw some of our um, context stuff in from what we've been doing. So the, our groups, we've had teams uh, doing a number of different things over the last few weeks. And part of that um, has been looking at some theoretical positions. Mm -hmm. so we've had groups working on uh, old fashioned realism, liberal internationalism, mm -hmm. Marxism, uh, feminism, uh, decolonialism. And we can see so many of these things coming in as sort of threads in this story. Yeah, I mean, so, so ISIS is, like I said, insurgencies play on real grievances. They don't, they don't, you know, they explore. And when I say real grievances, I mean that um, things that were legitimately wrong, a, a grievance is something that provokes moral outrage. And it's usually caused by human agency. Like this is, I, when I study what causes someone to become a mass shooter or radicalization like that? I study, you know, what is the grievance? They tap into a, a moral outrage. And the, the grievance is something that is, um, is not only a, caused by humans. You know, you can have grievance over, say, a hurricane, but it's usually the, the political response to the hurricane, not the hurricane itself. And so they, when we have moral outrage, we look at something a human did, a human act, or something we believe they did that we said that's wrong. The other thing that amplifies grievance is personal resonance. You know, if I'm seeing something that doesn't apply to me and doesn't affect me, I can say, yeah, that's wrong, but I'm not living in those shoes. But if I'm, you know, uh, if, if this is something that my, it's, I've been affected personally, my family, close family, I know within my friend network, I talk to people who have been impacted by this, that personal resonance amplifies the grievance. So when you're talking about grievance in these areas, and you mentioned decolonization, a lot of it is the makeup of these borders that were put in place after World War I was done by Britain kind of over a, a tea and a beer, you know, not very well thought out. And they just drew some simple borders. And that has been a source of frustration and grievance because it doesn't align with the tribal lines. It doesn't really well represent the populations, but they become calcified, um, the Pico Skies Act or Sykes Act. And, and that grievance was adopted by ISIS. Now, there's a lot of ways to deal with grievance. You can demand reforms. You can vote for change. In the Middle East, when you have dictators like in Syria, a lot of those mechanisms are not available. And so when you have groups like ISIS, they say, hey, come to us. We're the only ones who can contest the dictator. We're the only ones standing against the West and their efforts to colonize. And if you look at their propaganda, which I've done a ton, you will see references to crusader and colonization and things like that. They're tapping into real grievances or perceptions of grievance that will motivate their population, not just Syria and Iraq, but this global narrative. Now, with ISIS, they don't, you know, the people who are attracted to ISIS, I want to be very clear here. We're talking about a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of a population. But if you have a global message, you can still get a very tiny, tiny fraction and bring in 30,000 people, you know, and that can help you sway the tide. So when you talk about these, you know, Marxism, decolonization, feminism, um, realism, these perspectives often are around grievance packages is one way to think about it. You know, Marxism is looking at a social class-based grievance system and is trying to resolve it in that way. I would say from a system standpoint, a lot of these are simultaneous grievances and they're all muddled together like spaghetti. They're often overlapping, intersecting, and you can try and disentangle one, but you really have to deal with them as a group. There's a sort of specific side to this um, uh, question of uh, sort of political perspective uh, that I've been wondering about, and that is the way that the kind of 
liberal internationalist picture where we've got all of these multinational corporations um, working in these areas, uh, developing relationships between the corporations and then the internal governments of these areas over the long haul, how that picture, which is supposed to provide stability, uh, comes up against the, the sort of nationalist perspective or the realist perspective that uh, talks about spheres of influence and the way those things come together around the war, right? There was this idea that um, when we go to war in Iraq, that this is going to be an easy thing really ultimately because we have um, this incredible military strength. And so we, we make the move and then something happens and the, the plan doesn't go as expected. Yeah, the, the, the two biggest lies people ever say when getting into a war is the first is it will be over by Christmas and the second is God's on our side. Um, you got to be careful about those. The, 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 in, over and over again with these situations, the military is only the beginning of a very long protracted effort to provide stability. You have Iraq where they had the rise of insurgencies after the military collapse. You had the Libyan civil war I talked about. Go back to the U.S. civil war. Lee surrenders, and within 18 months, we have what amounts to an insurgency during um, Reconstruction period that lasts for years. These are almost predictable things, and you need to plan if, if you're going to do this. I would advise doing it at the last resort. But, you know, your question about um, liberal orders, and let me start at the top level. I think the liberal world order is sort of falling apart right now. And what you're seeing is these international agreements and these um, multilateral agreements between countries or corporations or things like that are really being challenged both from a lack of defense by the people who traditionally support them. You take this refugee flow, the European Union is supposed to be open borders, one size, we're going to all do it together. This refugee shock hits them. And the whole thing falls apart. And all of a sudden, each country's got its own nationalist interest that they're very similar to how the U.S. is reacting to the pandemic. We don't, we don't have a national response. We're doing it you know, one at a time. In the vacuum of that international order, you have regional hegemons show up like Turkey, Iran, Russia. And I want to be clear here. It's not like the U.S. has not been a global hegemon. But in the absence of the U.S. being a global hegemon, it's being replaced by regional. So you have these spheres of influence. Turkey has its sphere of influence. Russia has its sphere of influence. Iran has its sphere of influence. If you're and and if you're in that sphere of influence, you are increasingly subject to pressures and conflicts that are not going to get international support. We had a conflict start in Armenia, Azerbaijan, two weeks ago on the border between um, Russia and Turkey. That is an example of these regional hegemons going at it, and that's a very the last time we had that was probably in the 19th century, right before World War One, where you had this kind of regional order. Um, the last bit, which was the, the, the influence of the multinational corporations into these specific areas that ended up having conflict, it's, it's tricky because there's not a whole lot of, because some of these places were dictatorships, like Iraq was a dictatorship, and then you had a conflict, Libya uh, was a dictatorship, you don't have a plethora of international groups going in, but you have some very key large players, and they tend to, you know, the kind of companies that will go in and cut a deal to operate with a dictator or be willing to work in a war zone. You know, if you're talking like a, like a oil company, so they're not exactly humanitarian organizations by any stretch of the imaginations. And what ends up happening is almost invariably there becomes a grievance, a local grievance. Again, it's kind of that action on the gorilla, that outsider coming in, claiming our resources, taking what should be our money, taking what should be our benefits, um, you know, fueling it. You can argue whether it's right or not. Sometimes these perceptions are wrong, but the perception itself is a validly held perception. If you don't deal with that perception and you just try and ignore it and say, well, that's, that's wrong, you know, that's not right. Let me tell you why. You've got to work them through this. Um, and otherwise, this grievance can be funneled in. And a lot of times, these international companies become proxies for the moral outrage and grievance, which is then projected back upon the country uh, that, that they are most closely associated with. In the case of Iraq, it's going to be the U.S., almost invariably. Other questions, guys? You actually answered a question I was going to ask before uh, about the uh, when they drew, drew up the borders, but so thank you. Mm -hmm. I know I'll have one. Any questions in general on terrorism or violence before we call it?
All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Danny. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for the time. Uh, it was thank a lot you. of fun. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, really a pleasure having you. Yep. And if you want to read more or watch more, come on over to the Info Mullet and check it out. I will be sure to share the links that you posted. Oh, yeah. The links, I gave him some articles, which are just, they cover some of the background as we were reporting on this as it happened uh, over the timeline. So. Great, great. Yeah, I really appreciate just having the, um, actually, I did have one more question for you. Oh, go ahead. As it's coming through. So is it been, one of those simple questions or one that takes 30 well, I seconds? I never have simple questions. You know, <laughs> I just live in complexity land, so it's not, it doesn't like that for me. But it's a, a question about what do we do? You know, th these are our fascinating stories of complex interactions between players. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, as we look at these theories that we're studying, uh, we're at some point wondering about what can be resolved? This this is a good point because this is actually so I I have I didn't share I didn't share the academic articles I have two academic articles which are you know peer reviewed publications one of which says well what should we do right this is nice to say this is hard and difficult mm -hmm. what should we do and what we found studying this with these simulations we ran gazillions of simulations and looked at this from a complex systems and we said. Um, you know, you hear the phrase, governments need to reconcile with the enemy to reach a truce or a peace. And you hear this in Afghanistan with the Taliban. Our view is that a lot of these circumstances arise when governments are not reconciled with the people they govern themselves, first and foremost. And that the core root of many of these things, these grievances, is a... Um, uh, the legitimacy of the government governments is in question. The services aren't credible, and they tend to... Um, they're not treating their people very well to begin with, which creates the opening of this grievance existing to allow uh, a non-state actor to come in and exploit it. So we actually ran scenarios that were more effective at stopping an insurgency with far less military intervention because it focused on reconciliation and service delivery between the government and the people. And this is very touchy feely. It sounds like, well, are you just subscribing to hugs? And no, it's very practical. You know, you can you can talk about specific things, but a lot of times we jump to military conflict and military intervention. And the problem with military intervention is you are often provoking that accidental guerrilla response where you are coming in with military and therefore people are rising up against you who otherwise wouldn't. You're going to make mistakes or have errors or have war crimes on your side. It's, it's, a, it's a natural result. You're going to have ill will from people who died coming up, you know, and you're going to be, you're going to be targeted. So what we recommended as a lot of case is earlier intervention in the cycle. Don't wait till it gets out of control, but the intervention itself is not a, um, a military intervention. It's a, uh, what we called an armed civil affairs, you know, focusing more on working with the government, but getting so that the government is responsive to its people and providing services and credible delivery to those people as a way of short circuiting this loop that allows the non-state actor to exploit this grievance. And, you know, I can provide the link to the articles. We did simulations comparing it against, and it was much more effective. Of course, a simulation is a simulation and, you know, it's, it's easy to say on paper, well, this looks good, but, um, there's some other things that if you are going to go in militarily, use local forces as much as possible. Let the locals carry the weight. And there's an example of this that actually, so we worked a little bit with McMasters, who was the National Security Advisor, two, three, four. I, I lose track. He was somewhere in the Trump administration in the past. But the, the approach was use, for example, U.S. has air power. The Kurdish um, fighters in northern Syria had a very effective force. Let them carry the way of the ground fighting. Teach them how to call in airstrikes. The Kurdish fighters were then able to use the firepower of the U.S., but they were the local boots on the ground. And they're the local population. And that proved incredibly successful in taking territory back from ISIS. I didn't get too much into it. Hopefully the gentleman with the Syrian civil war discussion will. But the Kurdish forces in both the northern Iraq and northeastern Syria were very successful at pushing ISIS back with this combination of local troops uh, that were effective and, and, and well-trained and well-disciplined. They weren't out of control. They had the backing of U.S. troops from an air power perspective. And that combination kept us from, you know, having our soldiers on the street, causing problems, things like that. So that's, if you have to go military, you know, another approach is they call it the triangulation approach. You think of a triangle and uh, sort of with the, the broad base to the front and then one in the back, it's a local police officer, 
a local clergy or imam in this case, you know, someone with services and behind them is the military. And so you have a three triangle where the two sides facing the local population are the community-based police, the community-based, and this is in areas of conflict. I'm not going to recommend the U S is an entirely different discussion when it comes to police, but the, you know, these areas of conflict, you lead with the local service delivery and local police, and you have the military back in case they're needed. You don't lead with this very heavy. So these were some of the very practical strategic and tactical type things you can do to minimize this effect of the accidental guerrilla perpetuation of grievance and allowing um, the, the non-state actor to exploit the grievance. So, that's, yeah, I don't like, I don't like talking without offering solutions. So we tried. Well, that's what I, so I was like, I knew I wanted to get to this point. And so also, did you see under, you know, as you've been looking at these things that in part, much of this could have been avoided if only, um, there had, I mean, I could put it easily to say there had been no colonialism in that area. Well, but the other piece was more that, um, you know, as I look at uh, situations, for example, in Afghanistan or in Iraq, where you've got so many different tribal groups, if there were more logical um, organizations of the space that were uh, aligned with the sort of natural boundaries of the society. So this gets into a tricky, like, let's take Iraq and Syria. Um, the Ottoman Empire, which had that territory before, had provinces called Wilyats. And Wilyats in Iraq, they had three Wilyats. They had the north around uh, Mosul. Uh, they had the center around Baghdad and they had the south around Basra. That actually aligns very well to Arab, uh, excuse me, Kurdish Sunni in the north, Arab Sunni in the middle, Arab Shia in the south. Their Wilyats were um, constructed around these ethnographic groups. That doesn't mean they were absent of conflict though. You know, you can think of the Ottomans as a colonizing force be before you know, other colonizing force. They were not local. A lot of times they used um, minority against majority. So you would see these minority ethnographic groups used, put in power to then suppress majority groups. In Syria, the Alawite is a small Shiite ethnographic group that is where Assad's family from. They're put in power over the much larger um, Arab Sunni population. I think it's, it's, it's definitely colonization created a long tail of problems. But I've studied thousands of years of human conflict, and there's always a long tail of problems. I mean, this is one of these things where it's, if it's not one thing, it might be another. And I take the example, the counterfactual. So one of the great things about simulations is you can say, what if something else happened, right? What you go back and you change it. And so, you know, playing around, what if there was no Iraq war? What if the U.S. doesn't go into Iraq, doesn't replace Saddam? I think he, you know, the Arab uprising in 2010, the Arab, Arab, Arab Spring, I, th I don't think he survives that. I think he drops. You have instability. And that instability then, or excuse me, it's 2012, 2011, 2012. I was a little early. That still goes on in Syria. The, the Syrian uprising was based on the Arab Spring. You're going to still have mass instability at that point. You might, you still have the same tensions and grievances that are underlying. You may not have had the U.S. occupation. So you may not have had the disbanding of the Iraqi army. There's some other things that go on. But these moments of instability come and go. And I don't think it's, this is where I think gets to your point. You cannot make a perfect world that won't have problems in the future. The best way is to be understanding how to see them coming up, how to prepare for them and how to get ahead of them so you don't get caught by surprise. Um, when it comes to Afghanistan, I, you know, I spent two years there and um, I, it's a very difficult situation. There's 13 different large tribes in the country and it's, it's a conflict. Uh, you know, the only thing I can think of is there's a concept called the Loyal Jirga, which is a tribal like parliament system, basically a tribal council. When we went into Afghanistan, we tried to create a Western, here's the president, here's the leader, here's the federal. I mean, the, the Afghan tribes are very much like rural American ranchers. You go out, you go, you know, they're, they're like cowboys for the most. They don't want anything to do with the central government. They don't want to hear about what the central government's doing for them. So I think a distributed system that didn't have, well, here's the leader and here's all this strength, someone they don't know. Because once you do that, all the tribes are going to fight around it. Something that's much more distributed, council-based, probably would affect it. But it's also, you know, in some ways, it's got to be in their agency. You got to listen to the people on the ground and their agency. What do you want? What would work best for you? And I think, you know, one of the general universal criticisms of U.S. policies, we're not very good at listening. Or if we are listening, we're not hearing it until it's too late. And that's, I think, uh, a very valid criticism of, of any of these complex environments. Great. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming in today, Tim.
Um, did anybody have any last questions? Uh, we're almost out of time for today. Anything? Then thank you all. This was great. Again, Tim, so much. thank you so much. Yep. And I will see all of you uh, again. Have a great rest of your day. I will see all of you on um, Thursday again. We'll have part two of our week of presentations. And Tim, I'll, I'll be sure to get the uh, recording to you as soon as we get it. All right. Anything else? Thanks for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to follow the InfoMullet, visit us on Facebook or Twitter. And if you'd like notifications when we post new video content, click on the red subscribe button below the video. If you've ever wanted to become a mulleteer and support the InfoMullet, visit us on Patreon. We appreciate the support.